Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm going to get right down to this. Hollow core fiber, uh, I've got a fair bit to cover, and the first part of it is actually going to be about ordinary fiber. Uh, I should stress, by the way, Infineera doesn't have an axe to grind in this. We don't make hollow core fiber. Uh, we make transponders. Everybody's transponder, whether it's from Sienna or Nokia, they'll work on hollow core fiber. They'll work on uh, regular fiber. So let's just celebrate for the moment optical fiber because it is the foundation of everything we do. Uh, you know, without the, the oxygen that feeds the internet, that, you know, that oxygen is actually bandwidth. Uh, and it's delivered by conventional optical fiber. There's over 5 billion kilometers of fiber around the world today, over 400 million kilometers uh, produced annually. We've had four decades of progress. I often describe optical fiber as the asset that keeps on giving because you put it in the ground decades ago and by upgrading transponder technology, as we heard from the 400ZR, ZR+, Plus, or high-performance transponders for long distance, uh, like submarine or long-haul long communication, we've really achieved an incredible uh, increase. One megabit per second uh, per channel communication when optical fiber was first deployed, right through to 800 gig per transponder today. Uh, in terms of the fiber capacity, it's about 80 terabits per fiber pair. Uh, you know, these are massive increases. So why is fiber so successful? And one of the reasons dates back to good old Isaac Newton. Because any of you who work with wireless technology, you know that when you send out a piece of information, it goes everywhere. Uh, Isaac Newton actually discovered this in the context of gravity. But signals, as they emit from a, a transmitter, they usually, uh, their energy is usually spread on the surface of a sphere. So it's an inverse square law. If you go twice as far away, it's not half the, the signal power. It's a quarter of the signal power. So the strength of the signal is inversely proportional to the distance, uh, square of the distance. That's if you allow the signal to go everywhere. But one of the key reasons that optical fiber is successful is it doesn't happen that way in fiber. It's a waveguide. It's an optical waveguide. We're guiding the power of the signal. So how does conventional silica core optical fiber work? Well, basically, you create this amazing material. It's a micro-engineered material where the core has a slightly higher refractive index than the cladding, and signals are trapped inside the core. They're guided within the core. And if you make the core small enough, there's only one pathway through that core. We can call that a mode. And so you may have heard the term single mode fiber. So if you have single mode fiber, you don't experience, experience modal dispersion, which is a good thing. Now, silica core fiber also has a certain a, a property of attenuation. It's where the energy of the signal is absorbed as it passes through the fiber. And because silica has certain chemical characteristics, it absorbs energy at different wavelengths. If you look at the detail on that graph, it tells you what characteristics, like uh, Rayleigh scattering and, and material absorption and so on, where do these absorptions come from? But you'll also see there is an attenuation minimum. And it's at the C and the L bands. It's a certain uh, band of wavelengths. All of our long distance communication today happens in the C and the L bands. But look how much more is available in fiber. The problem is it sucks up too much energy at those, uh, at those wavelengths. So when I talk about capacity limits in optical fiber, I'm talking about limits in the C and the L bands. We have another property because of glass, and it's a nonlinear property. Any of you working in wireless communication or DSL copper, you're very fortunate because those are linear media. One of your strategies for improving the signal to noise ratio uh, at the receiver is turn the power up. You just shout louder, basically. You can't really do that in optical communication. The analogy is if you're listening to music and you keep on turning the volume up, at some point it's going to sound distorted. And it's the same in glass. It's the same in optical fiber. If you turn the power of the signal up too high, you experience non-linear effects. These are the, the effects that you may have heard of self-phase modulation, cross-phase modulation, four-wave mixing, they're all bad. You don't want them to be happening. 
So, the capacity limits of optical fiber today, based on things like dispersion, on nonlinear effect, uh, sorry, attenuation, nonlinear effects, the capacity limits that we are, you know, faced with are about 42 terabits per second in the extended C band. If you light up the L band as well, there's another 42 terabits. If you go for super C band, super L band, some manufacturers are pushing the bandwidth of their optical amplifiers a bit further. It's, it's about 100 terabits per second across those two bands. It's reach limited. So if you want to go further, it's likely you will have less capacity in your optical fiber. So that 100 terabits that I mentioned in the super C and super L bands has a reach of about 1,000 kilometers. If you want to go 3,000 kilometers, you'll take a bit of a hit, down to about 75 terabits. If you want to go a really long way, 7,500 kilometers, it's about half uh, your original starting point. So, glass also has a particular refractive index, which means that the speed of light in optical fiber is a lot slower than the speed of light in air or in a vacuum. You might be aware that you know, the speed of light in a vacuum is a cosmic speed limit. We haven't found anything that goes faster than that. In fact, if any physics researcher does find that, as they did a few years ago, they publish a paper and say, look, we know we've done something wrong. See if you can find out where we went wrong. And in that particular case between CERN and a lab in Italy, they'd found out some wires were in the wrong place or something. So there's an opportunity here. If we want to have lower latency communication, we could move from glass, which has a high refractive index, to something like air, which has a much lower refractive index. Right, what have I told you about conventional optical fiber? Because you'll notice I haven't mentioned hollow core fiber yet. What I've been trying to tell you is all of the properties that optical fiber has that we need to mimic in hollow core fiber. So optical fiber acts as a waveguide. And it's not just a waveguide, it has to be a single mode waveguide so that there's no modal dispersion. Modal dispersion is, 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 is very high, it's a high magnitude effect. Ideally, you want this not to happen. We know that attenuation varies with wavelength in silica core fiber. So the communication we have today is in the C band and the L band. There's loads more potential capacity if only we could get at it. <coughs> But glass is a non-linear medium. If we transmit at too high a power, we'll start to incur optical penalties. And glass has a higher refractive index than air or a vacuum. So if we could build a wider bandwidth wave, uh, waveguide, that would increase our potential capacity reach. A more linear optical waveguide would also allow us to transmit at higher power levels which means that we could improve capacity and reach. A completely separate market driver, because those first two are capacity-based, a separate market driver is low latency. Because very often in low latency applications, we don't care about capacity. We just compare, uh, care that this is a, a low latency system. And all of the limitations that you'd, you see here are because optical fiber is made from glass. Right. What about hollow core fiber? Well, hollow core fiber, as the name suggests, doesn't have glass as the, as the medium. So how do you create a waveguide in hollow core fiber? Remember, we've got to guide the light, and we've also got to guide the light in a single mode so we don't have modal dispersion. So there's a couple of different ways that people found to do this. First of all, they, they used a technique called photonic band gap. And by the way, People who give properly detailed hollow core fiber presentations, even they say these are quite hard things to describe, uh, what photonic band gap means and, and other things. But original uh, hollow core fiber was photonic band gap. That was the way that they found to trap the light. That seems to be a technology dead end today from the point of view of optical communications. But hollow core fiber is not just used for optical communications. It's used for laser cutting technologies. So if you need a huge amount of optical power delivered to cut through steel or, or some other material, this might be a good way to do it, but not for optical communications. The alternative approach was developed in the, in the uh, around about 2011, 
And it's called an anti-resonant effect. It's also the, the way of trapping the light uh, in the fibre. And the ultimate in technology today has this wonderful name, dual-nested anti-resonant nodeless fibre, or DNAMF. Um, and DNAMF, well, certainly uh, hollow core fibre generally, is mostly a great British invention. The original proposal for hollow core fibre was from the University of Bath back in uh, around about 1991. Now that was photonic band gap. That, so that's, as I said, that's a, from a, an optical communication point of view, that's not the approach people are taking today. However, the first anti-resonant fibre was, was uh, proposed in the uh, Russian Academy of Sciences uh, in 2011. But all of the latest work, the, the really groundbreaking work, is being done at Southampton University. Uh, and you know, it's, it's, it's fascinating to see that group was also the group that developed the EDFA in the, uh, the erbium dope fibre amplifier in the, uh, the mid-80s. Another way to look at the evolution is that all of these structures here are sort of an, an evolution from the photonic, photonic band gap technique through to the anti-resonance uh, approach. And then once you're onto that track of anti-resonance, you start to tune the structures. Now, the reason I'm showing you these nested structures is just to point out how incredibly precise and delicate hollow core fiber structures are. By tuning the relative dimensions of those structures, this is how you achieve single mode operation, for example. And the, the sizes we're talking about, the overall diameter of the fiber is about 125 microns. The internal structures there, the bigger structures are 30 microns and the, um, and the smaller structures are 10 microns. So these are truly sort of microengineering miracles. So the big news that was announced earlier this year at, at the OFC conference, it's in March, uh, or was in March. So Luminicity is the commercial spin-out from the University of Southampton. And so they announced their DNAMF fiber was able to achieve less than 0.22 dB per kilometer at 1310 nanometers and 0.18 dB per kilometer at 1550 nanometers. <clears throat> now, the reason that's important, a couple of different reasons, <coughs> If we compare that to classic SMF28, which is the most commonly deployed fiber in the world today, um, you can see the relative uh, uh, loss levels. So at 1550 nanometers, which is right in the middle of the C-band for long distance communication, uh, it's almost, uh, as, uh, you know, in fact, DNAMF is below SMF28. But even more important, at 1300 nanometers, it's way below SMF28. So that's pointing to the fact that we've, we've potentially opened up all of these other wave bands at a low attenuation level. Now, some of you may be deploying an ultra-low loss version of SMF28. So SMF28 ULL, these are the respective numbers. So in the, out in the O-band at 1300 nanometers, it's, so the DNAMP is still way below SMF28 ULL but it's just about on par in, uh, in the C-band. So this was a major breakthrough because it's the first time that hollow core fiber has come down to usable uh, attenuation levels. And particularly uh, there at 1310 nanometers, that's really starting to, to look interesting from a point of view of widening the bandwidth and capacity in the optical fiber. So what are people using it for? Generally speaking, all of the applications today are about lower latency. So, for example, we've got low latency services, EU networks issued a press release, uh, working with uh, Interaction and, and London Stock Exchange. Of course, these low latency services, they're crazy. You know, people are trying to get zero latency or as close as they can to zero latency, uh, and they don't mind how much they pay for it, right? So uh, even though hollow core fiber costs quite a lot of money at the moment, doesn't really matter in a, in a situation like that. Comcast is experimenting with distributed data center deployments around cities. Many of you will be aware, the lower the latency, once you start distributing servers, the lower the latency between servers, the higher the throughput, uh, you know, the transaction throughput on those servers. And then BT has a very interesting example uh, in 5G front hall. 
there's a protocol timeout in 5G that limits the distance from the radio mast to the central office. And the more radio masts you can support from a single central office, the better your 5G economics. It means you'll be able to deploy more 5G aerials in, a, uh, in an area. So by switching to holocore fiber, they could go about 50% further, which means that you can get a lot more radio masts uh, con uh, controlled by a, a single central office. And Piotr uh, described about uh, the um, uh, quantum uh, encryption, key encryption. I must have a chat to you about that because I'd love to put that in as, a, as an additional use. But it's based around the low latency aspects of holocore fiber. Yep. So what about the future potential? As I say, all of the applications today are based around low latency. So first of all, let's look at this attenuation. And remember I, I said that silica core fiber, all of the fiber that's in the ground today, has low attenuation here, the C band and the L band. But basically, the, the, the announcement from Luminicity that you saw just now shows that we can push right out to the O band, right out to 1310 nanometers, with low attenuation. It's a much, much wider range of wavelengths. Now, what we don't know is how we amplify the signals across those wave bands. There are ways to do it, but one of the, the, the challenges with hollow core fiber is that even EDFAs, they don't work uh, in hollow core fiber. The, the EDFA effect, because uh, there's no core, Right? You've, got, you've got nothing to pump. People are talking about cladding pumped um, systems. It's, it's all very experimental. The way that people do it at the moment is that they splice a piece of conventional fiber onto the hollow core fiber. You pump that, and then you go back to the hollow core fiber. Well, you won't be able to do that if you're going to do wideband communication. So you know, we really need to put our thinking hats uh, on for, for amplification. But there may be more to come here. You know. We could, we could potentially push to shorter and shorter wavelengths uh, with a low attenuation. And by the way, we know that we can build lasers at any of these wavelengths. That's not a problem. So, you know, transponder manufacturers like Infinera, we can build the transponders at those wavelengths. We just need to figure out how to amplify at them. The lower nonlinear penalty also means, instead of, you know, getting this distortion as you, as you increase power levels, one of the strategies would be to send much higher power uh, optical signals into the fiber without incurring this nonlinear penalty. But when you look at the research papers for uh, uh, low nonlinear effects in these fibers, it depends what they fill the core with. Because the options are, for example, you could fill it with air, you could fill it with an inert gas, it could be nitrogen, it could be a, a, a noble gas, and people have actually used a vacuum in hollow core fiber. Now, if you, if you fill with an inert gas, they very often fill at very high pressures, 300 atmospheres. Uh, now, imagine a cable break where in addition to having to splice hollow core fiber, you've got to pressurize the entire length of fiber to 300 atmospheres. Might be a little bit of a practical challenge. Equally, imagine a subsea cable which is, got, which is filled with a vacuum, or uh, Filled with a vacuum, is that? I'm not sure. Anyway, <laughs> and you have a break. You've now got several hundred kilometers of seawater sucked into your fiber because the vacuum has pulled it into the, uh, into the fiber. So there are some practical issues we need to figure out. Now, the questions about practicality, can it be made in quantity? These are extremely delicate structures. Does it work with the existing fiber ecosystem? Because right now we splice conventional fiber onto the ends of HCF to do things like to connect into, it, 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 into uh, uh, patch panels and, and fiber connectors and amplifiers. What about the deployment guidance? Um, what about pull forces, bend radiuses, radii, uh, you know, connector fitting onto, onto these fibers? Again, we've taken the easy way out so far of just splicing regular fiber uh, onto the ends. But if we want to take advantage of the real characteristics of HCF, we need to find another way to do this. How will it age after deployment? Because we know that silica core fiber has an aging profile based around hydrogen, hydrogen aging and, uh, and other effects. We know how that works in 
silicon core fiber, but what about these microscopic structures? Are the microstructures vulnerable in, to in-service deformation? Now, I'm particularly interested in subsea cables, where the cable's at immense pressure. Now, these really delicate structures, are they going to survive uh, in this kind of environment? How can we amplify over the additional wave bands? What are the nonlinear advantages of the HDF that you're choosing to deploy? Because you'll probably choose to deploy air filled at one atmosphere. But does that have a, non, a low nonlinear uh, characteristics? It's, you know, it's tricky. So there's lots of questions to ask, but a really brief summary of, of, of what I've been talking about today. HCF is being deployed in low latency applications with multiple field trials. There are some commercial uh, um, uh, actual deployments as well. It has a future potential to deliver a lot more fiber capacity with wideband low uh, nonlinear performance. And between then and now, there are quite a few practical issues that we need to solve. Uh, but most, most of them are engineering problems. They're not necessarily theoretical limits. And, you know, we are very good at solving engineering problems. So fingers crossed that, that it could well have a bright future. So happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Thank, thanks very much. If anybody has a question, please come to the microphone. Yes, please, please come to the microphone. It's a long walk. <laughs> I know. Hello. Uh, how do you fit the uh, spectral dis uh, diversion, spectral uh, dispersion on, on the hollow fiber? How do you fit the spectral dispersion? Yep. Uh, so some frequencies, some frequencies are going faster than the other ones. Oh, yes, but each, right. Uh, but that's true in normal fiber as well. Yeah, uh, I think in normal fiber, yep. you have another piece of fiber that has, uh, it can inverse the uh, spectral dispersion, so you can put it in, in, in some pieces and correct the issue and go on. So what you're describing is chromatic dispersion, yep. uh, where longer wavelengths, the red end of the spectrum travels faster than the, than the blue exactly, end. The same thing. Uh, now we don't use the dispersion compensating fiber that you're describing today in conventional networks. Because what happens is you're used, today we're using coherent technology that does that correction mathematically in the receiver. Um, so in hollow core fiber, the, you, don't, you also don't have a, a, a chromatic dispersion effect. So all of the wavelengths in air travel at the same speed. But, yeah, but it, but the refractive index difference is is much smaller. Okay. So, so I know what you're saying, but as as you know, from a from a transmission point of view, they pretty much travel at the same speed. They don't in op, in op, in glass core fiber because the refractive index is so much higher, but it's much much lower in in air. So the differences are much much lower as well. Uh, yeah, but if you're using a whole one, that's comes pair with the next question. Do we have, or are planning to have, um, a, a transceiver that can use the whole spectrum of bands? Uh, well, we can do. The, the, so they are the, spec the chromatic dispersion will be much bigger because the band is much wider. Um, so that again, that's true in glass. Uh, chromatic, uh, so chromatic dispersion has got a wavelength dependency, but all your magnitudes are so much lower. So. Another way of me answering it is, if we can get it to work in glass, it's so much easier in air, because the overall magnitude of, of, of the of the refractive so index is lower. In practical terms, the dispersion will be so little that it won't affect. Yes, and also we know how to deal with dispersion. Since since the advent of coherent detectors, mm -hmm. chromatic dispersion has actually been our friend in optical networks. That's why we no longer have dispersion compensating fiber. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Hi, uh, Ben from BGP Tools. Uh, a question on like how you repair uh, faults in these <laughs> hollow fibers, because it seems particularly spicy in that regard. So if yep. you get a if, you know, standard, put a shovel through one, um, what is the process of splicing that together? Um, because surely you can't splice together the, the, the micro-engineering inside, yes. so you presumably lose some of the benefits the moment the first strike happens on the fiber. Follow-up question. How is this then produced? Do you just buy a humongous, like, 100-kilometer roll of it, or...? 
Oh my God. <laughs> so bear in mind, uh, we don't make uh, hollow sure. core fiber. Okay. However, I have seen the presentation from Luminicity. Um, so they've done experiments of splicing hollow core fiber to hollow core fiber and hollow core fiber to conventional fiber. Uh, and they talk about the different losses. Now, from what I understand, you absolutely need a specialized splicer. So they're doing this you know, pretty much manually. Uh, so you know, the, the auto, all the auto alignment uh, functions and things like that that we see today in modern splices, all, all bets are off in, uh, in hollow core fiber. It, it, it will need a new generation of, of splices with different kinds of alignment because you, you'll need to have sort of radial alignment and, and so on. Um, so the losses they're talking about are, are low. They're fractions of a dB. Um, they're, they're probably around about the same levels as a good splice uh, that you would have in conventional fiber. But I think there are some practical... I, I think, you know, that's a, that's a, a good, good case scenario. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hello, Jeff. Uh, Hi. Excellent talk, thank you. Um, Dave Wilson from Glide. Uh, my question would be, do you have any sort of a feel for the timeline on this? I mean, are we, are we going to see Google slinging it out the back of a ship in five years mm. or ten years? You know, what, what's, how far away is this actually going under the sea or yep. whatever it may be? Well, if, if you're talking about under the sea, I think it's a while. So um, in terms of sub, subsea, there already is a roadmap for cable capacity. Uh, so the, the technique is known as SDM, space division multiplexing. Uh, and there are particular reasons why this is a, a good approach in subsea versus terrestrial. Because submarine, submarine cables are power limited. They're electrical power limited. Um, at the end of that SDM roadmap, rather than it being hollow core fiber, it's likely to be multi-core fiber. Um, and, and so a hollow... That's a whole other talk. That's a whole other talk, yeah. Uh, which, I, you know, maybe I'll propose for the next one. <laughs> um, in terrestrial networks, this is why I've stressed, all of the initial applications have been around low latency. Now, low latency is also valid in subsea. You know, the further you go, the, be the more the benefits are of having a lower latency medium. So HCF is absolutely an attractive option for subsea, but I think uh, somebody else asked, you know, do you make this in tens of kilometers or... I think they've been making it in very limited numbers of kilometers at the moment. Um, now, to, to be able to make it in several hundred kilometers, which would be needed for, for a subsea cable, um, I think we're, you know, probably a little way away from, from that at the moment. Yeah. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks Thank you very, very much. much. Um, Anybody has additional questions, then follow Jeff. Will follow up with Jeff later. And the thing I missed at the beginning was say if you have feedback, please put it into the Mattermost, Mattermost channel, and that will increase the chances that we get Jeff back to do his next talk. <laughs> All right.